You know, chief spaces. As long as Gunnel's army is here, we're, we're gonna still be on air because you have such a big following that it's like they they're here for you. You know, nah, you're you're definitely a big part of it as well, man. <laughs> Can you believe it's been 35 episodes? I was writing it today. I'm like, one wow. a week, and then we did we did the spaces, so those didn't really count. And like, so the 35 number is really just kind of an estimate. Okay, I was gonna say, does that count the spaces? I don't think that. It, I, I think that only counts the recorded pods that touched the that that touched the actual like the podcast feed, if you will. That's fair. That makes sense. So, KD episode 35. The KD episode. Are there any Chiefs? Are there any famous Chiefs with 35? Well, damn, you know, Katie's actually number seven now. It's not 35 anymore. <laughs> <laughs> let me hit this. Let me hit this retweet real quick while you come up yeah, with it. Same. Uh, how you feeling? How's the, what, how, how's the West Coast treating you? It's good, man. You know, I'll actually be in KC in a couple weeks, man. So hopefully you can get a couple drinks. Really? Yeah, really? I'm, I'm coming for a Christmas, me and the family. So Proud of you, man. Yeah, man. It should be a good time. Uh, it'll be my, it'll be actually. Brittany and Maverick's first time in KC during the winter time. Cause normally when we come, it's during the summer. So, yeah, I got to get some uh, some extra clothing there. <laughs> now you are gonna know what it's like to actually be in KC around the winter time. It's crazy. Like you ain't been in, you haven't been in my city for so long that like you don't know what it's like. <laughs> well, I've I've been in Kansas City, but you're talking about in the winter. Yeah, I haven't been. Actually, that's crazy. I haven't been in a KC winter in like five or six years. That's a shame. If there's my come, I'll make sure I come in the summertime. <laughs> That's a shame. I was like, I don't want to do the cold no more, man. Well, it's good to have you back. We'll welcome you back with open arms. Anything else? There? Everything else good? It is that holiday time of the year, man. Yeah, you know, just uh, put up the, the Christmas tree yesterday. So uh, that was cool. Still doing some last minute shopping. But uh, yeah, everything's going good, man. Oh, we ain't even started last minute shopping yet. Last minute shopping don't happen until like we get in the teens. Like once oh, December, like literally like the week of. Yo, know, like once I get December 15, 16, I'm like, oh, all right, you know, let, let, let me. Like, start. I feel like December should still count as last minute shopping because a lot of people get it done in November, especially for yeah. Black Friday. Like Black Friday is yeah. a big Christmas shopping day, so I, I guess I guess you're right. Episode 35, Chiefs Coast to Coast. Aaron Ladd is here in Kansas City. I'm from Atlanta originally. That's East Coast. Mark Gunnels is in L.A. He's on the West Coast. Episode 35, a lot to unpack. Chiefs fall to the Bengals in Cincinnati. We'll recap everything that happened in that AFC slugfest between Kansas City and Joe Burrow's Bengals. We'll head down to Vegas. Just a bloody Sunday for Mark Gunnels. If you notice, he wasn't his usually smiley, his chipper self. There was none of that, and there's a big reason why. So we'll head down to Vegas with some Band-Aids and see what Mark's got to stop the bleeding this week. And, and we're previewing Chiefs-Broncos, Kansas City, with an opportunity to win the AFC West once again. We'll talk about what they need to do to get it done. Always love making you all part of the show any way we can possibly make that happen, whether it's here on the video feed, on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. I see people checking in all over, Mark, and we appreciate y'all. Rocking with us on Chiefs Coast to look coast to coast. Leave hashtag C to C on any of your comments. We'll throw you into the show. We also have a voicemail line, 816-514-1267. We want to make you part of the show. Let's just get right into it, man. Let's let's get some game recap going. Mahomes avoids. He's a magician. Chiefs recap. 27-24. That, that one's going to haunt Chiefs Kingdom for quite a while because it's the exact same score as the AFC title game and the same result as well. The Cincinnati Bengals defeating the Kansas City Chiefs 27-24. It's the third straight win for Burroughs Bengals over the Chiefs. Get this, Mark. They're all by three-point margins. Burrow 25 of 31 for 286 passing yards and two scores. I thought P. Ryan was the bingo that really killed Kansas City in this one, and we're going to talk a lot about this game in different aspects, but I thought his production specifically, 27 touches, he turns that into 155 scrimmage yards for Kansas City. I thought that was one of the things that really changed the, the game for Cincinnati. What's kind of your initial impersonations of this game? Yeah, I mean, you hit it right on the head right there with Piron for sure. I mean, he was a guy that didn't go down on first contact. 
He was very physical. They set the tone up front. Their deep, the offensive line really bullied the Chiefs' defensive line. It was really uh, discouraging to see. Guys were getting pushed back three to four yards uh, every carry, it seemed like. It was really bad. But also, we got to mention the obvious, right? Joe Burrow, Joey Cool. How many times did he just take the check down, especially with Piran there, get five, six, seven yards? It wasn't pretty. It wasn't cute, but it was efficient. He was 80% on uh, his passes, I believe. So, I mean, the guy played a very smart, efficient game. There wasn't these big shots like last year, especially in that first meeting where you saw Chase go for 266 yards. That wasn't the case. A lot of the stuff was in the middle of the field. There wasn't no goal balls on the sideline. I thought Trick McDuffie did a really good job when he was tasked to guard Jamar Chase. But – Burrow, he took what the defense gave him, and he did that repeatedly. He didn't get antsy and look for some big shot plays. He just played a smart, efficient game. And, it, you know, I know you hear this comp- comparisons a lot, but when you face a guy like that, it really does remind you, especially as a Chiefs fan, like a Tom Brady type of game, right? Mm. Like, it's not pretty. It's not sexy. It's not these 50-yard passes down the field off script. It's just efficient, get the ball out under three seconds, find your check downs, move the chains. And that's the kind of feeling that I got watching that game. I was like, this this feels like a Tom Brady type of game. A lot of people have been saying in the aftermath that Cincinnati kind of has that feel of a team that's not afraid of Kansas City when they step on the same field as them. They know they can compete with them. They know they can beat them. And now it's three games in a row that they've done exactly that. I wrote down three notes kind of trying to review this game from a Kansas City perspective. The first one was the inability to get Joe Burrow on the ground, and I think that shined its its head in the biggest parts of last year's game. We were talking about going into, la- into the AFC title game, nine sacks against the Tennessee Titans uh, defensive front, how critical it was going to be to get to Joe Burrow and finish those sacks off, and didn't happen in that game. Chris Jones talks about all the all the motivation that he got from – not finishing off a sack in that game, going into this one, and then just one sack for Kansas City's defense, and it comes on uh, that last drive. George Karloftis gets it. Uh, the the Kelsey fumble is one that you write down as uncharacteristic, and I know that we won't spend a lot of time talking about that on this platform because it is uncharacteristic for a guy, but it reminds me of the uh, of what Mahomes has kind of said in the press these last few weeks about that one dumb play a game for Kansas City. It's a it's a play that you can't describe. It's a play that's maybe not necessarily in their nature, but it always seems to 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 show its head at the wrong point in time. And that's what that play was for me, Mark. That that fumble, it, it completely flips the momentum from you feeling good as a, a Chiefs fan and you're headed the right direction and you're salting this game away to not only have we given them a chance to to take the lead, but also change the game script in in, in the possessions and all that good stuff. Oh, 100%. And this is one of those games where the possessions were limited. Both yeah. teams had under 10 possessions each. So that made every possession so much more valuable, right? When especially you got the Bengals having these four, five, six, seven minute drives, and Mahomes is on the sideline with his big jacket on trying to stay warm. So <laughs> in, in that moment, you're up by four, you're near midfield. I can comfortably say I think you at least come away with three at worst in that possession. I think probably they go down and get a touchdown because they were kind of rolling at that moment. That was a first down play, uh, but Kelsey was still fighting for extra yardage. And once that ball came out, you knew at that point it was going to be very, very difficult for the Chiefs to win that game. I bet you the probability of them winning went dramatically down at that point on the ESPN chart. So, yeah, man, it was a really tough uh, play. But like you said, it's uncharacteristic for Kelsey. Not anything you need to linger on and uh, harp on too much, because obviously, if you saw his uh, piece today from his podcast with his brother Jason Kelsey, I did see that? Yeah, yeah he uh, took the accountability, and you could tell he's very, very angry about it. Also, another play that stands out, and, and this one in the moment, it, it, it was a, a lightning plug on social media. I, I was watching from the couch, chilling. Uh, it had the perfect place to 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 dissect all the uh, all, all the vitriol from Chiefs Kingdom, but it's the third and three, fourth down. Mahomes kind of scrambles around and eventually gets sacked. Um, and of course, you play out the you play out the entire downs, and uh, the the kick is no good. And we've talked about special teams on this platform going on and on. But I said take the check down. I felt like the check down was there. It, 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 is it uncharacteristic for Mahomes to to, to kind of try and find something or make something that wasn't happening there? What, what did you dissect from that play, if you will? 
So I think people are overblowing this because if you watch the all 22 film, you obviously you can see the, all the players. If he were to go to the check down, there was a guy right there and you probably yeah. can't see it on your TV screen. But if you watched all 22, the guy was right there. By the time the ball would have got to McKinnon's hands, he would have been right on him. So maybe McKinnon could make a miss. I mean, it's possible. We've seen him make guys miss a lot of times, especially last year. But, you know, let's just say the guy tackles him right there. You maybe get a yard or two. So obviously it makes it a more uh, manageable fourth down. But the other thing on that play, Orlando Brown got beat instantly, like within a second. And the guy came inside off the edge. So it definitely took Mahomes' eyes off of where he was trying to scan the field. And I think that yeah. was the bigger part of it is Orlando Brown getting beat so quickly. It just blew that play up. It's uh, there's been some pressure numbers that were going around about Orlando Brown. I know Andy Reid was talked about or excuse me, asked about that today at his usual Wednesday availability. We'll get to some of his comments, but still trying to unwrap, unpack uh, this Cincinnati game and, and how it moves the AFC playoff picture around. We know Kansas City and Buffalo tied for the one seed, but Buffalo has the advantage as far as the head to head matchup, both the teams nine and three. And really, what I found more interesting beyond the, the Bengals beating the Chiefs, because really it's a toss-up game. We're sitting here talking about three different plays that change the momentum, and uh, these teams are pretty evenly matched despite the one dumb play, as Patrick Mahomes calls it. I feel like if these teams play 10, 10 games in a row, it'll be 5-5 five, five or 6-4 uh, either way, no matter how many times you want to you wanna play it out. I think it's interesting, you know, that it's happened to the same team again and again. And I wonder if that changes how Chiefs fans view uh, the Bengals now. Like, I, I remember sitting on this po this podcast with you going into the AFC title game. There was no respect for Cincinnati. They shouldn't even come off the bus. This, this, and the third. They're not in our league. They're not in our weight class. Joe Burrow's not there yet. But the chatter after this one has been different. And we'll talk about we'll talk about something a little bit. I want to I want to hear what you have to say about your respect for Kansas City now, or what you feel like the pulse of the kingdom is coming out of this game. Uh, I, I know you you meant you meant to say Cincinnati, but uh, yeah. So let's let's break it down real quick. The first game in the regular season, you can say you know what they caught us off guard, right? You know Chase had a historical game. That's not going to happen again. He had two hundred and sixty six yards, right? Like, and they still only won by three. And then you had the third and 27 where Spag sent the house for some reason and left guys on an island. So you can chalk that up as, you know, we just did dumb stuff. They had a historical game, right? And they still only won by three. The second game, you're up 21 to three. Yeah. You could talk. And then the second half, everything implodes. Chiefs fans, I'm talking from a the consensus here, right? Not necessarily how I felt, maybe a little bit, but anyway. After that game, the consensus was that was the worst half of Mahomes' career. That was a complete meltdown. Guys were arguing on the sidelines. Why didn't they take the three before halftime? You it know, was bad. Right? Like, so people still at that point didn't give Cincy their full credit. Now, this time, the third time, right? All the talk was there's no way Mahomes would go 0-3 against Burrow. There's no way they're going to lose to them three straight times. You know, they have a chip on their shoulder. They're focused now. They're not going to catch them off guard. The Bengals have won three games in a row. They're hot right now. This is going to be an over-my-dead-body game for Patrick Mahomes. He didn't even have 250 yards total. It, um, you know, and it, it wasn't all peaches and roses. And I think now – People are really coming to the realization. And I, I was here before this game, but this just adds on extra carry on. <laughs> last week, give my credit. I wasn't talking big crap last week. I wasn't talking big boy, oh, bet the house and all that stuff. So no, I was you already it, it was a muted Mark Gunnels last week. <laughs> yeah, so I was already there on the respect, but obviously it goes even more now because they beat them for a third straight time. It's time to admit that this is just a good football team. There's nothing wrong with admitting that. I think Chiefs fans can admit that with the Bills, which is crazy, right? Because, you know, you've actually beat the Bills a couple of times. But for some reason, it took forever for them to finally come to the realization that this is a good team. I think it's because the Bengals' ascension to greatness happened so quick. 
I think with the mm. Bills, we kind of saw this slow, slowly building up year after year, and it was expected. Whereas the Bengals before last year, they were a four and twelve team. Yeah, you know, granted Burrow got hurt, but they weren't winning games before he got hurt that year, and then allowed them to get a Jamar Chase, and then he just took off in year one with them together. So I think the fact that it wasn't expected, it wasn't built up, is why it took so long for people to accept them as a really good football team. It's funny that you mentioned the Bills because this exchange between a couple of reporters from the Kansas City area is something I wanted to bring to our platform because I think it it, it is the prism in which a lot of Chiefs fans are seeing these Cincinnati results through. It's Zach Martin on Twitter at Zach Martin TV saying the five Chiefs losses in 2022 are by a total of 16 points. They're fine, guys. The fan base is acting like the sky is falling. C dot, my guy from 610 Sports Radio here in Kansas City, chimes in and this is where I really want us to jump off on, uh, Mark. He says, outside of the obscure, obscure Colts loss, the other four are against the two teams you know you're going to have to beat to get back to the Super Bowl, which the standard is they're held, they're held to. That's Cincinnati and Buffalo. The Chiefs are judged on two questions. Did you make the Super Bowl? Did you win the Super Bowl? They will have to beat either both, either or both Cincy and Buffalo to answer those questions. That's why this one feels different because three straight times – isn't luck i think I, I, context matters uh, obviously cincinnati and buffalo the two teams we mentioned previously are the standard in which kansas city is held to those are the two teams that armored up the most to try and swing with kansas city in the postseason right they sign a von miller uh you know jamar chase and they load up and when we're talking about most explosive wide receiver duos or trios or wide receiver cores it was kansas city and cincinnati in the afc and then uh, everybody else had to, to take a hike uh, obviously Tyreek Hill changes that and, and, and whatnot. But I think we're putting a bow on Cincinnati versus Kansas City. Uh, obviously, you're going to see them again, uh, but I think going forward, you know, we need to have a little bit more respect when we have these conversations. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I made a tweet the other day, and I, I don't know if you saw it or not. I basically said that I believe that the AFC will come down to these three teams, ultimately, who goes to the Super Bowl. Chiefs, Bills, and Bengals. And I think those will be the top three seeds in the AFC because right now the Bengals, they're the fifth seed, but they're tied with Baltimore in that division only because Baltimore beat them, so they have the tiebreaker. But with Lamar being out potentially the next three weeks, I, I think the Bengals are going to win that division. So you're going to see those three teams as the top three seeds. And that's why I think getting the one seed is very important because if the Chiefs win out and the Bills lose one more time, they will be the one seed. Because at that point, if you're the one seed, you guarantee that you won't face both of them. Yeah. You're, you'll face one of them most likely in the AFC title game. But if you're a two or three seed, then you have to play most likely both of them, one in the one in the divisional round and then one in the AFC title game, assuming you get past the wild card weekend, obviously. Enough about football. What was Justin Reed doing on Twitter? You gave him that <laughs> advice, man? Because this this seemed like straight out of the Mark Gunnels playbook as far as, you know, I, they got me. They got me. You might have got me in the first half, but I'm going to double back and make sure I get one more word in. What What's going on, man? Well, you know, if you're a safety for the Chiefs, that means you have to rile up Chiefs Twitter. That's like that's part of the contract, I, I think, at this point. You know, you're wrong for team. that. <laughs> and and they both came from the same team. You both got them from the Houston Texans, right? So I I mean, what else can I say? Like you got Tyron Matthew from Houston. You know, he had battles with the Chiefs Twitter multiple times. Then you get Justin Reed from Houston, and now he got Chiefs Twitter in an uproar. So there must be something there. I mean, at this point, there's some data that we can uh we can back. It didn't seem like Cincinnati was that riled up, though. Like, we called this kind of bulletin board. I remember talking about this on the pod last episode. You know, we called it bulletin board material or whatever, extra motivation, yada, yada. I don't know if it really I, – I, Joe Burrow, after the game, said, you know, it really would have hurt me more if he had gotten his names right and knew who he was talking about. And You didn't see Jamar it, Chase do this in his face? The tuna in a can, I know, is making some. Hey, I these two teams don't like each other. We 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 can say that out loud in in the open now. Like that, I think that 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 is what makes a good rivalry. Not only that, you know, they're tight games and three point contests, but you know, there's some there's some bad blood here. But is it a rivalry until the Chiefs win a game? 
See, I don't, I don't necessarily like everybody's like, oh, it's it's not a rivalry because it's one sided, but it, it just the contentious nature of it, and the, you know, smoking on this pack and Eli Apple talking about that that KC pack hits every time and yada yada. Like you know, you you can see the the symptoms of a rivalry. I know Kansas City hasn't scratched on the win loss column yet in in like these last three or whatever, or it was a three zero skunk, whatever, whatever. But this is absolutely a rivalry because they're going to play again this year. Oh, see, so you're you're booking that. They're going to play again this year. I do think they play again this year. I don't know what round, and, I, and there's still a lot to be discussed and settled and all that, but I, I think these two teams play again this year. Yeah, but, you know, it's funny, going back to the bills Bengals thing, with the Bills, it, that's a rivalry too, but it feels a lot more respectable. Like, both teams have, like, a sense of respect for each other. I'm not 13 saying the Bengals- seconds. 13 seconds is all it took to change that, realistically. And and I'm not saying the Bengals and Chiefs, obviously, they respect each other. They're all professional athletes. But there's more uh, ratchetness there. There's more. (laughs) I don't know. It just feels different between the Bengals and Chiefs versus. Because you don't get that trash talk, that back and forth with the Chiefs and Bills. just always a great, highly competitive game. And then after the game, they shake each other's hands. With this one, it's like, uh, it's a little bad blood there. K Cook is rocking with us on YouTube, says we usually are good with the run, not this game. I believe uh, talking about P Ryan, we must find a way to get to Burrow. And I don't know if blitzing is the answer. Appreciate you rocking with us there. I wrote down three letters kind of trying to like out of game recap, but just trying to figure out some more stuff on, on how the Chiefs offense is. And it's MVS, man, an absolute roller coaster experience. And this one, he has some crucial catches. He has a crucial drop. And uh, this from Rustin Dodd on Twitter says MVS is a baseball player who strikes out 225 times but hits 30 home runs. I thought that was pretty funny. What do you make of the the MVS experience uh, through 13 weeks in Kansas City, Mark? That was a great analogy because I had one as well. I mean, he catches all the hard ones, but he drops the easy ones. It's really crazy, but it's one of those things where you know, obviously, when you have a more difficult catch, you're probably more naturally locked in, right? And you got a gimme. You're like, oh, okay, I got this one. It's routine. And then you don't catch it. So, you know, you got to take the good with the bad. And this is the thing that this isn't new, you know, right? If you watched him in Green Bay, he had the case of the drops as well. And if you saw Packers fans, they were telling Chiefs fans, like, hey, it, you know, he's going to have some great moments, but he's going to have some frustrating drops as well. So it's just part of the MVS experience. I mean, you got to take the good with the bad. But I think overall, He's done what you expected. I mean, he's on pace, I think, for 700-ish receiving yards uh, as your third or fourth guy. I mean, that's all you can ask for. Yeah, 33 catches, 586 yards, and a touchdown so far on the year for MVS. Matt Waldman does a lot of good scouting stuff in the in the NFL on Twitter, and he diagnosed MVS's inconsistencies, if you will, and tried to basically understand as you said, why he makes the hard stuff look so easy and the easy stuff look so hard. And he basically said it's a fundamental a fundamental issue. I'll read the tweets here. He says the root cause of MBS's drops versus contact is not tracking and possessing the trajectory well enough to earn optimal position with his body and his hands. Basically, he doesn't track the ball very well, which is something that Tyree Kill was known so well for. Waldman continues to say it's amazing that MVS catches the ball with how often he doesn't track it well. He actually does the hard part better than the easier part. We talk about MVS in the context of the wide receiver room, Mark. I mean, like this is a room that has looked drastically different from last year and it's going to look drastically different next year. But you figure MVS factors into that mix somehow. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I know they have a chance to get out of it after this year, I believe, but we'll see what happens. I think considering you know, McCall Harmon is probably not going to be back next year. Still up in the air on Juju. I know, I know they want to bring him back, but we'll see on that. So, yeah, I think you got to miss such a fair price. It's like, why not, right? Because the guy can stretch yeah. the field. He can make big plays for you. So, And he's a big body receiver. So I, I do think he will be back next year. Let's update some wide receivers who have been banged up. It's Kadarius Toney and McCall Hardman who could be in the mix to make their return sooner rather than later. Here's Chiefs head coach Andy Reid on their availability. He had lost some weight. He's put, put the weight back on, which is good. Um, and he's out running now, and uh, he's about, he's getting close. Yeah. What's your expectation? You think you might, you might have him back next week? Uh, there's a chance. Yeah, there's a chance. Uh, give him a couple more days here. We'll see. But he's doing well. 
That was Reed on Hardman. He also said Tony, who was a limited participant in practice on Wednesday, could work his way back into the mix sooner rather than later. On McCole Hardman, it's been four weeks on IR, and I know he's been tweeting up a storm. Y'all are Twitter buddies and always going back and forth, talking about Jet Emoji this and Jet Emoji that. So uh, what, <laughs> what, what would he mean for the Chiefs, the Chiefs offense down the stretch, Mark? I mean, he adds a dim dim dimension they don't have right now. You know, obviously with the jet sweeps and, you know, his straight line speed is something that you can't teach, right? So he adds another dimension. You know, obviously when you have him in motion, you know, you don't really know what to do, right, as a defense because sometimes he goes in motion and he gets the ball in the jet sweep, sometimes he doesn't. But it's a way that Andy Reid sets opponents up and then you, you get caught off guard. So I think uh, it's one of those things where, you know, you probably don't understand what you have until he's gone, right? Because, <laughs> you know, Chiefs fans have been really hard on McCole Hardman uh, over the years. But I think now without having him, you see uh, you're missing that dynamic factor, right? That that gadgety type of moment or a guy that can just take a handoff and go 30, 40 yards. You know, it's kind of like a cheat code, right? So I, I do think you you do miss that, especially when you're missing him and Kadarius Tony. So it's like uh, because, you know, when you brought in KT is one of those things where it's like, OK, he can do everything that Hardman can do. Right. So when you don't have either one of those guys, it, it really uh, stresses your offense. I don't know if Kansas City would openly admit this as well either, but I think it also gives you that versatility in the run game that takes a little bit of pressure off Pacheco. Takes a little bit of pressure off McKinnon. McKinnon was crucial this last game, I felt like. And just giving 10 a breather, giving an opportunity to, hey, you know, obviously you're the guy. You're going to get the touches. And, and I love to see him involved in the screen game, especially on that, that first drive as well. But you need something to be able to, to, to add some versatility. And we know how good Kansas City is and giving defenses a lot of different looks. This one kind of off the field. It's Patrick Mahomes nominated for the Walter Payton Man of the Year Award, man. He talked about that today. I thought that was cool. Had his third annual 15 in Mahomes Gala yesterday. And I think the, I mean, to just say it bluntly, I think Kansas City is blessed to have 15. Should be very fortunate. I know you say your prayers to, to 15 every night before you tuck yourself in in your 15 pajamas and your 15 at, at undies and you know it's uh it, it's cool to see him honored i know fans can vote and do all the whole twitter thing and everything but I, I was surprised to find out that kansas city the chiefs actually have the most winners of the walter payton man of the year award and i think patrick mahomes would would be a great addition to that yeah i think it speaks to you know the 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 city the franchise the type of guys they bring in right like the chiefs try to bring in these high character guys Obviously, Patrick Mahomes has done wonders for the Kansas City community. You know, I mean, the guy brought Whataburger there. I mean, come on. You know, you know. He should win it for that alone, right? Like, <laughs> stop the count. You know, you know, but not, but seriously, though, a lot of the things, and then not just him too, but Brittany, right, with the soccer team, just a lot of things in general, what that family has done for Kansas City, I think it's brought a different light to the city, how people view it, you know, and – I, you know, I just think uh, he's just been a stand-up guy. I think he's done everything right in the outside the football field and obviously on the football field. But, you know, it'll be an honor for him to win that award. I know he would love that. Uh, it's one of those awards where people would say, you know, they'll rather have that than win an MVP, right? Because, like, it's such, such a uh, – it's about you as a human, right? You know, what you do for others and not just your ability as an athlete, right? Because they're all professionals. But, you know, this is just the next step. And I think that Mahomes definitely probably deserves it. Absolutely. Let's preview this next one, man. Stop it. Stop it. You can't do this. You can't escape. You can't make these plays. You can't make these throws. Come on, give us a sneak preview. Chiefs preview. Rolling right along here on Coast to Coast, episode 35. Mark Gunnels in L.A., Aaron Ladd here in Kansas City, and the Chiefs. At nine and three, are traveling to face the three and nine Denver Broncos. The game that was scheduled to be in prime time, no longer that. It's a three oh five kick, mostly sunny with a high near fifty five in Denver on Sunday. Kansas City nine and a half point favorites. We'll get Mark's picks later. He's still licking his wounds. We'll see what he has as a follow up act to last week. Kansas City can clinch the AFC West with a win, paired with a Chargers loss on Sunday. Kansas City has won third. Team straight against the Denver Broncos. My goodness. 
We'll talk about that as well a little bit later. But first, we got to turn the page, man. I, I feel like this from Cincinnati to Denver has been the toughest for not only Chiefs Kingdom, but I feel like the team as well. Andrew was a little spicy today. A lot of questions still about Cincinnati. A lot of wondering like what you could have done different, this and that and that. Wednesday is usually the turn the page day. Do you have any concerns about any lingering ramifications or anything sneaking into this one from Cincinnati? No, nah, I don't because it's a divisional game. And we hear how Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes always talk about divisional games. Like they, they put it on such a high pedestal, and as you should, because these games, you know, it can kind of go either way for the most part. It doesn't really matter about the record or things like that. You know, you see the, these division upsets all the time. So I think they understand that. And obviously the first goal every single year is to win the division. Because you can't really get your other goals until you do that, right? You I mean, sound like a company man. Look, look, look at you just towing the company line right well, now. Yeah, you know, so the first thing is win the division, and then win the conference, and then you know go to the Super Bowl, right? In that order. So, and they have a chance to clinch the division this weekend with a, a Chiefs win and a Chargers loss, and they play Miami, so that's very, very likely that that can happen this week. So I think they understand that. So I'm not really concerned about it. I think they're just annoyed the fact that people are still talking about Cincinnati because they're ready to move on mentally, right? But obviously with the media, you know, you guys are still asking Cincinnati questions. You guys, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you guys, you're, you're talking, talking into a microphone right now, Mark Gunnels. Yeah, but you you're are, in the room. You are you're part of the media. Room. You're the one asking these Cincinnati questions on Wednesday, Aaron. Move on. Move on. It's Broncos week, baby. Let's ride. Oh, gosh. Best way to move on is to handle your business. So I want to set up two sound bites. The first one, it's Patrick Mahomes saying, you know, we have no choice but to turn the page because this Denver defense, which is ranked third overall yards per game, second overall yards per play, second overall in points per game. They're a good defense, according to Patrick Mahomes. Their defense is special. Uh, they have a good scheme. Uh, they have good players. Um, and so, uh, when you play division opponents, you obviously know they've studied you all off season, so you try to have a, a a concept of what you do best, but at the same time throw in some wrinkles so that they they can't be on top of your your best plays. And so, uh, uh, for us, to be a great challenge against a great defense uh, to go out there and try to find a way to to put up enough points to win. I heard you giving this defense his flowers on your uh, pre show spaces, so I already know how you feel about this defense. You giving them respect. How about a little bit more? Yeah, I mean. Like you said, I mean, they're top three in every stat. You know, and I saw a crazy stat, right? If they just had an average offense, you know, there would be a nine or 10 win team right now. It's bad, man. Like, it, there would it, be it, a nine or 10 win team if they just had just the average offense, Aaron. Just it, average. Nets yard per game, they're 27th. Yards per play, 26. Points per game, they're worst in the league. Time of possession, bottom half, rushing and passing, bottom half. I mean, it's it, it's nightmare scenario if you're thinking about where this team was when they acquired Russell Wilson to now where they actually are 13 weeks in with Russell Wilson. I think everybody and their mom wants a redo of this trade, but they're gonna just going to have to eat this one. Andy Reid talked about Russell Wilson today and said he still sees some semblance of his old self. Oh, I thought we had we didn't have sound for that. No, my bad. I thought we did too. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> you go. Yeah, he said he doesn't have it. No worries. Okay. Uh, wh what have you seen from Russell Wilson this year? I mean, he's a bottom five quarterback this year. I mean, if you look at any metric, it, it, will, it will tell you that. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's really it's mind boggling. And you know what? I, before they got him in the offseason, I even said that I'm not sure why people are so high on, on this acquisition, especially when you consider they have a first time head coach. And Nathaniel Hackett, they yeah. have a new they have a new uh, offensive lineman. He has new receivers. He didn't play one snap in the preseason. And I was saying at the time, I don't understand why is that the case. You no, are a preseason king. You love preseason. Preseason poppy over there in L.A. Mark. I mean, but seriously, we have a whole new scheme, a first time head coach, new receivers, a new offensive line. Why don't you play it at least a little bit in the preseason? I mean, Mahomes even played in the preseason. I mean, I just, it didn't make any sense to me. And I, I think, you know, that was a, a part of it, right? When you're starting playing behind the eight ball, you don't have any chemistry. You don't have the timing. And then secondly, if people watch Seattle the last couple of years, he's been declining. He's not the same Russell Wilson. He wasn't before they, they made the trade. 
so Seattle, they got out in front of it. They saw it coming and they made one of the best trades in NFL history. I mean, that pick is going to be a top three, top five pick. And you got freed up a lot of cap space. Uh, Seattle can make the playoffs this year. So they're ahead of schedule and you're going to have a top five pick with a lot of cap space. So that was one of the biggest robberies, not only in NFL history, but sports history, because Russell Wilson's not going to get better. He's only going to get older. So I, I don't see how this is going to work out. And then to add salt on the wound, they gave this man an extension. Big time money. A single down. So now you're stuck with him for the next four or five years because nobody's going to trade for him. Yeah, you know, I'm a big JTO Sullivan guy, quarterback school on uh, YouTube, Patreon, and he's breaking down. He usually breaks down winners. He's done Russell Wilson a couple times, and ultimately what he decides on is decision-making is also bad. It's not just that he's getting older. He's a 30-year-old, mid-30 guy who's kind of the, the game is getting faster than he is, uh, you know, deciphering information. You know, it, it's a lot of bad decision-making on tape, and – Kansas City is going to try and force him into making a lot of bad decisions. I know Steve Spagnuolo will talk about that ad nauseum tomorrow. Do you put any stock into there being a 13-game winning streak against Denver? I, I remember a, a, a quote floating around preseason that, you know, you talked about Kansas City's big goals being win the division, get to the AFC title game, whatever, whatever. I remember one of the the Denver reporters saying, beat Kansas City was on their, was on their training camp was on their training camp list, and, you know, that streak is ending this year. Do you put it – because I remember – and I'll toss it to you after this. It was at, like, nine or ten in a row, one of my first seasons covering K, uh, KC, and I asked Andy Reid, and he's basically just like, look, that the, those games don't win this game. We don't even care about that. That number means absolutely nothing to us. Does it mean something or does it mean nothing? I think for Kansas City it means nothing. I think for Denver it obviously does. I mean, the Chiefs are the standard in the, in the division. You obviously want to knock them off. That's how you can reach your goals by winning the division. Obviously, that's not something in the cards for the Broncos this year. But, you know, I think at this point, with them being at the very bottom, you know, you know, you kind of can take away something from the season. Like, hey, we beat Kansas City one time, right? And because, <laughs> and, because like, look at it. <laughs> You're wrong for that. <laughs> You're wrong. Seriously, though, because I would say this, but it doesn't even apply because – they can't even tank, Aaron. They don't have their first round pick. So it's like you might as well win because losing is not really doing anything for you except maybe making you have a, a higher second round pick. I'm not even sure they even have their second round pick. I can't remember, but I know they don't have their first. So you can't even tank. So you might as well try to win the game. This is from the Chiefs Media Guide. Casey has won 13 straight against the Broncos, franchise record for most consecutive wins. Against a single opponent, a win on Sunday would move the Chiefs into the fifth longest winning streak against a single opponent in NFL history. So I guess it's time to figure out what's going to happen on Sunday. Mark's got all the answers, so let's head down to Vegas and get them. Place your bets. Oh, there it is. There it is. Two touchdowns. Win by at least two. Let's go to Vegas with Mark. I mean, you just can't contain a smile on your face when that you even smiling after what happened last week. I, I just love, I just love that 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 song. I just love it, or whatever you want to call it. I just love it. <laughs> I love when you say two touchdowns. <laughs> I mean, that's your go-to. I can't wait till you say it about this game this week. But first, before we get your predictions for this week, we have to revisit what was a dark week here on Chiefs Coast to Coast. <laughs> Mark Gunnels went 0 for 3 in his predictions last week. It was a tough one, and he previously was two weeks undefeated, so he was kind of due. He picked over total yards on Mahomes. That number was 345 and a half. Mahomes didn't even hit 250 total. 81 and a half receiving yards over for Kelsey. That didn't hit either. Kelsey only finished the game with 56 receiving yards. And then Mark liked the Chiefs to win the two and a half. And uh, we know how that one ended. So 0-3, that has not happened yet this season. Speaking about turning the page as we've tried to turn the page from Cincinnati, Mark Guttles is going to try and turn the page from Cincinnati as well. We're on to Denver. His season total is 17-15. and 15. We're still above 500. We're going to try and keep it that way. So, Mark, what you got for us? 
So before I do that, let me reflect one one quick oh. second. <laughs> you can't turn the page. No, but no, seriously, because you know, I gotta I have to I can't reflect after wins and not do it after losses. That would be front running, right? So the worst part about this is Vegas always has a way of humbling you, right? Because I was 17 and 12. I'm thinking I could run away from that 500 line this week. But now it's like, uh oh, I'm only two games over <laughs> now. Back up, yeah. Now I gotta still fight my way to keep over 500 for the year. Cause this this could be my separation week. If I go two and one or three and zero, oh, you can pretty much say I'm, I'm gonna be over 500 for the year, right? Pretty comfortably, I think. I don't want to say anything now. Comfortably now, now it's like, uh oh, now you're back. Only two games over, and none of none of them were even close. That's that's what hurt the most. None of them were even close to hitting. Kelsey, so. maybe, but he the, the 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 first half is what killed you with Kelsey, and I know we didn't touch on that in our game review or whatever. But Kansas City cannot go an entire half without Kelsey having to catch, even if it's just a quick dummy pass or drop off or whatever. It was just so weird, and it, it, and it just showed you how they looked without him. Yeah. So let's move on though. So <laughs> I have three plays again this week. I'm starting off with the spread. I'm taking the Chiefs minus nine and a half. Look, I don't see the Broncos being able to score that many points. I know their defense is really good, but I just believe the Chiefs can cover this by default based on how inept the Broncos' offense is. So they may win by exactly 10, 13, 14. I'm not predicting a complete blowout here, but at nine and a half, I think they can at least win by 10 points in this game. And I'm also going with the total points, alluding to that. I know you were in my space, and I didn't give it away. The, the total right now is at 43. How can I not take the under here? You have to love the under in this spot. You can't take the over in any Broncos game. I don't see them scoring more than 14 points. I think they're in that 10 to 13 area, especially now with Courtly, Courtland Sutton. I don't know if you saw that report. He's most likely out this week. That's a big hit to their offense. So I think the Chiefs score around 24, 21-ish while the Broncos are in that 10 to 13 area. So at 43, I think that's way too many points here. So take the under. And then my third play, I got one player prop. I'm going back to the well again, Aaron. I know it failed me last week. Travis Kelsey's over on receiving yards. They brought it down a little bit. It's at 75 and a half this week. I think he bounced back in a major way. And before the last week, well, the last two weeks, he didn't get that over on this total. But before that, he hit the over in five straight games at this number. So I think he gets back to that this week. I know it's a really good defense, but you could tell he was really, really angry. I think they really make it an emphasis to feed him early and often. So those are my three plays. Chiefs minus nine and a half, the under on the total points at 43, and the over on Travis Kelsey's receiving yards at 75 and a half. Usually I feel good about your picks, but these make me nervous. These make me nervous, Mark. You don't, you don't, what's your, do you like the under? Love the under. That's an easy, that's a layup. I mean, Broncos. That's my favorite score. My favorite yeah. The, the, the thing with the chief spread and the Kelsey thing, it, the chief spread is, you know, they're, they play down to their opponents. We've talked about this on this podcast before. There's no juice in this game. This game has been flexed from prime time. No, nobody even wants to put up with the stench of the Denver Broncos offense so bad. That they'll flex Patrick Mahomes at a prime time. Nine and a half seems like too many points there. And then with predicting Chiefs pass catchers, you just never know who it's going to be. Kelsey is my one guy who we usually think is the is the safety blanket or like, all right, I'll make my money back here. But I get nervous. It's Wednesday in the injury reports. I don't know who's going to be active as well. Let's just hope you stay above 500, big He's got to go two and one this week, man. Just give me two and one. I'll take it. <laughs> He's hedging his bets. Chris Kilt is rocking with us on YouTube, says KC definitely has to move on from last week and stay focused on winning the division. Probably will have another crack at Cincy. What do you think about that one? Yeah, I mean, I agree. I agree. I think you will play them again. Uh, like I said, depending on get the one seed or not, you're probably going to have to play them and Buffalo. So That's all the show I had written down. You... What you doing this weekend? Um, just some more Christmas shopping. Last minute, I guess I can't say last minute. It's, it's not last minute. Okay. It's big border war energy, baby. I'm gonna be 
in, oh, Columbia, yeah. in Columbia on Saturday. Yes, sir. I, I'm clearing COVID protocols some point this next couple weeks, this next couple Can't days. We should, put, we should put like a little friendly, a little friendly wager on it or something like that. Well, you know, you're not gonna you're gonna ask for points. I already know that. You no, know, because the tiger tigers are undefeated, you know, they nine and oh. So do you need mm-hmm. points or are you taking it straight up? I'm gonna need, I'm gonna need, I'm gonna need, they lost oh, okay, 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 yeah, okay. they lost like 37 last year. Mark, come on. Well, don't, don't, don't talk all big and bad. We're nine and oh. <laughs> it's gonna be good to be in the building, you know what I mean? It's gonna be, hey, it's gonna it's be, gonna be good. a great atmosphere. It was fun to be in in the field house last year, but you know now it's in the now now it's at home. It's in it's in the backyard. You got to handle business. Hey man, it's like, you know it's, it's gonna be a party when Aaron's back in Como. I know you're like the mayor there, so they're gonna roll out the red carpet for you. You're gonna see your old professors, some old classmates. It's gonna feel like a homecoming. So you should probably get there on Friday because you're gonna be. It's gonna be it's gonna be a parade. Aaron Lass back in town, baby. He's on 41. He's a celebrity. I gotta get the statues out, baby. Let's go. You're wild. I was not that guy. What's your favorite bar in downtown? (laughs) I was not that guy. Nah, good episode, man. Did you uh what's that place called? Oh gosh, it was like Thursday night. They had like special drink specials on Thursday night in Como. Talking about field house, field house, yeah. You used to go to field house, didn't you? I've been there every once in a while. Okay, <laughs> yo, I can't stand you <laughs> for Mark in LA, Aaron and Casey. We out of here. <laughs>